Welcome to a discussion with Tianrong Chen, where we're going to be talking about his paper Generative Modeling with Face Stochastic Bridges. As the name implies, we're going to be talking about generative modeling and the new approach that Tianrong has helped to develop. I hope you enjoy that. I'm doing the research in the machine learning by, by using the optimal control theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, by deriving some math, you can find certain connection, connection between the deep learning and the stochastic optimal control. And at the end of the day, you'll find that they are strongly connected. Uh, my previous work is on the optimizer. And you can mm -hmm. find that the first order optimizer and the, and the second order optimizer are the subcase of the optimization methodology in the control theory, which is called differential dynamic pro programming. Mm -hmm. They are basically the, exactly the same thing. And the stochastic gradient descent are the subcase of uh, the differential dynamic programming. And the work I have done just one year ago, one or two years ago, is a, Sch is a Schrodinger bridge, which is a very famous concept proposed by a, f uh, a mathematician in the 1932, Schrodinger, mm -hmm. Mr. Schrodinger. And, uh, and it turns out that it can derive from the optimal control theory. And the shooting approach tells us that how to do the transportation between two distribution. As, and as you may know, in the generative model, what we are basically doing is transporting from the Gaussian to the real data set distribution. So, so it is how mm -hmm. I use them to, 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 to build up a algorithm for the generative model by using the shooting bridge. And, it is, and the methodology is derived from the control theory. And for this work, it's basically the same thing. So we want to find a transportation from the Gaussian to the data distribution. And there are some multiple ways. Just to think about these are two distributions. And mm -hmm. you can go this way, you can go this way. So long as you can find a transportation, then it is valid. Then what is the best one? Mm -hmm. uh, we can let me it. let me ask some preliminary questions on that. So I think we can start discussing the paper because we're kind oh, of yeah, segue sure, to sure. that now already. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're talking about transforming from one distribution to another. And just to get the, the context of that correctly, we're starting essentially in image generation tasks with a random set of pixels. And we're considering each pixel to be derived from a distribution uh, that's sort of Gaussian noise or some simple distribution. And we want to map that in some way to a complex distribution, which is the image that we're looking to get at the end. Yep. Am I am I thinking about that correctly, just so that we have the preliminaries right? That's exactly correct. OK, OK, very good. And what kind of information do we have about the complex uh, distribution that we want to end up in? Because we're not looking to map it onto an already existing image, right? Like, then it would just be exactly. a deterministic transformation. So what mm -hmm. is it exactly that we want? Like, what is it exactly that we know about this distribution that we're trying to map it to to begin with? It is very interesting. So uh, the mathematic requirement is that you should have the, some compact, continuous, and a smooth distribution. But, but, but in practice, what you have is a sample from the data distribution, which means you have the empirical distribution. You only have the samples from these distributions. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is to, uh, hopefully, we can have the continuous representation of this distribution, just like a Gaussian, we can write a closed form, then you can sample the any point in in a space. But in reality, we only have the empirical samples from the distributions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that generally speaking a problem? So I know we're outside of the context of the paper right now, but right. if we're just talking about the practical point of view of implementing things like this, mm -hmm. is the empirical distributions that you use in the calibration or however you call it, um, is that a concern generally? Does it lead to problems if the images are not uh, similar enough or? Uh... Yeah, I think it's quite general. So like the image distribution, just like the, uh, we use the ImageNet and the CIFAR 10, you can see, you can think about each one, one of the, each data set, each data, one, one picture, like the one dog or cat is the one data point or the support of this empirical data set. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's start thinking about the methodologies then for taking these simple distributions to the more complex ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're saying specifically in the paper that you're looking at velocity-based uh, generative modeling. Could mm -hmm. you elaborate a little bit on what uh, velocity-based generative modeling is in contrast to just generative modeling? Uh, it's very interesting. So, so uh, I think we can start discussing about the diffusion model or the flow matching model first, which are mm -hmm. the most uh, popular tools on the market. So, mm -hmm. uh, the ultimate goal here is to do the transportation from the Gaussian to the very complex distributions, mm -hmm. and uh, you can construct certain map. Like if you are familiar with GAN, we can use a neural network to direct map from the Gaussian to the data distribution. Yes, you can do this, but you all have a very complicated loss function. But the concept of the flow matching and the, the diffusion model tells us you, you can use a very simple loss function, but you need to construct a certain dynamic systems. And if you go down a little bit in this paper, I, I think I can I write down some equation for the diffusion model. Oh yeah, here. So oh. equation three and four tells us how the system looks like for the diffusion model and the flow matching. So these two dynamics links the distribution of the Gaussian and the data distribution. And what do you really to do? is using a neural network to approximate the so-called drift turn in this dynamics. The drift turn means, uh, like in equation three, the drift turn is the one right in front of the DT. And the drift turn for the flow matching is the turn uh, right in front of the uh, DT as well. So, so uh, the whole the whole concept here is very simple. It's a mimicking, is a mimicking the dynamics, which links the Gaussian and the data. It's super simple, right? So so you have the so you have the data point from the Gaussian. You, you can just render symbol from it. You have the data point from the data distribution. So you just render sample the pictures in your image data set. Yeah. And then you construct certain dynamics, which is represented by equations three and four. And don't worry about its form. Like the F is analytically available, and the gradient of the X of the log P is analytically available. Mm -hmm. So given the data point from the Gaussian and the data, you, you can write down how does it look like for, for, the, for the terms in the bracket in the equation three, and the same thing. You can write the equation, the, so you can write the analytically closed form for the VT in the equation four. And all our goals is uh, using a, a neural net, to use a neural network to approximate the, the, these two terms. And uh, these two terms in the bracket and the VT is called the drift term in the dynamic system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so, which one of these is for flow matching? Oh, so the equation four is for the flow matching or the bridge matching. So they are basically the same okay. thing. The only, the only, the only difference is, is that for the bridge matching, you, you will have an additional GT times the DWT, and it basically means the noising process. So you are artificially adding some noise in this dynamic system. Okay. And for the but flow matching, so okay. So maybe my conceptual understanding here is a bit wrong, but my take was that flow matching and bridge matching are not identical approaches in the sense that in flow matching, you have one distribution, as I understood it, that you continuously transform over time to, to fit it to the final distribution. And with bridge matching, you kind of have a sequence of distributions that you're trying to um, iteratively improve toward the, the final no. one. Okay. No. So, but Mathematically, they are exactly the same. So I think I oh. write some explanation in the later paragraph. When G, the GT in equation four tends to zero, it is mm -hmm. flow matching. If GT is not zero, non-zero, it is bridge matching. So it's a super simple. 
I think okay. I wrote it in the oh in the last sentence in this pro, in this paragraph. Oh, this, this part here, as extensively discussed in the previous study, blah blah. This bridge uh -huh. matches frameworks. Yeah, blah right. blah. Right. So this part essentially, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Cool. So they are basically the same thing, uh, uh -huh. and uh, the reason why it is uh, so so I will call it a. I will call it a velocity-based generative model because if you think about the physical system, then the drifting is basically the velocity, right? So we we are interested in the data point generated, which is uh, the xt, right? But what we are estimating is the the terms in the bracket and the vt, and the, the v is basically the velocity, and the term in the bracket in the equation three. Is basically the velocity as well, but it's in the different form, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I I prefer to call it the velocity model. And in the previous work, uh, they call it the velocity prediction for this kind of the work. Just use a neural network to predict the drift term, and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so my work is basically called acceleration generative model. So we, instead of predicting the velocity, we can build up some dynamics which also links uh, the Gaussian and the complex uh, data distributions, but we, we, we use the neural network to approximate the acceleration. And, the, and it will have a couple properties and uh, advantages and in the next few slides of this paper will explain why. Just yeah. before we go there, when we're saying that we're introducing the acceleration into this, are we literally referring to the derivative of whatever this function is? Is that is that um, a correct conceptual understanding of what new quantity we're introducing or is it something else just that it happens it's, to be called uh, if, acceleration? If, uh, it's a basically a pretty good question. It's not direct derivative. So it's a time derivative of the velocity plus some noise. Okay. Yeah. So if you go down a little bit into and look into the problem formulation, you will find that. Mm -hmm. You're talking yeah. about this one? Yeah, here. So mm -hmm. if you think about the, and again, if the GT in the equation five tends to zero, then you are right. Mm -hmm. If GT yes. tends to z tend to zero, then, then then the time derivative of the velocity will be the acceleration. But uh, in practice, we prefer to randomly add some noise. Uh, basically, it's not necessary. And uh, I I tried. If you don't have the noise, it it will still work. But there's another work called stochastic interplant, and it proved that. Uh, if you have the stochasticity, then then the the performance will be improved in the sense of the KL divergence of the real data set and the generated data set. So mm -hmm. that is the fun the fundamental reason why we add some noise here. And uh, in the stochastic optimal control theory, since it is called stochastic control theory, so. Uh, I will add some noise here because I come from this area. So, so, yeah. Could you elaborate again? What are the benefits of, of adding it? Like, what are the shortcomings generally if you try to construct a model like this where you don't have that noise term? Because I believe it was in the flow matching where you didn't have any noise term in the velocity at least. Um, so it seems like it's still a valid modeling approach to not introduce any noise in, um, in each of these. Why yeah. why is it that we want to do it? It's a it's a very deep question, to be honest. So mm -hmm. uh, there are a few ways to construct the generative model. The one is by using the OD, which is without the noise, and another one is the SD, mm -hmm. which is with the noise. And uh, as I mentioned, there's a one paper called stochastic interplant, and in in, in that paper, they proved that if you are dealing with uh, stochastic differential equations, 
Then if you measure the KL divergence of the generated data set and the real data set, you will find that uh, the bond is more tight for the SDs instead of the ODs. So that is the reason why I think that people prefer to use the uh, people prefer to use the stochastic differential equations. And, uh, and uh, an, another reason why I use the stochastic differential equation is that uh, the, 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 the prior work like the flow matching was published just a half years ago. And if you check out the uh, absolute performance of uh, <coughs> that work, uh, you'll find that the performance is not that ideal compared with the diffusion model. So at that point of view, uh, I will prefer to use the, I will prefer to use the stochastic differential equation. And, mm -hmm. and this is a consideration from the theoretic perspective from the stochastic interplant and the empirical perspective, which is from the flow matching paper, yeah. <laughs> Can we think for a second about what we're trying to do here? So we're trying to minimize this quantity here. And mm -hmm. this R, I, I take it as a, as a cost matrix. So we're trying to reduce the cost in um, each of the possible dimensions. So we have a deviation here from the actual, like from the actual target that we have, and then our realized uh, version yep. of it. So that's clear, but then we also have the acceleration term in here. And we're trying to minimize also the acceleration term um, in this integral, and I don't, I'm not quite sure about the the limits of the integral first and foremost. So I would like to get into that. I would also like to understand why the acceleration is in here. If that's uh, uh, an attempt to reduce the amount of um, maybe um, oscillation that you have in the system, or or why do we have that term? Uh, let me explain. It's a. Uh, I I hope it will be easy to be understand. So okay, so let's see. <laughs> all right. First, uh, you have some constraints, like uh, the terms after the such that. So mm -hmm. first, you need to follow some dynamics, right? Right. And in the dynamics, you have some AT. And then now, mm -hmm. which means, so, oh, oh, sorry, you have the long such that. The first one is your dynamics. And, and then and another one is your initial condition of your state which is a concatenation of your X and the V, which is your, your position and your velocity. And, uh, your, and you will have the terminal requirement, just like at the end of the time, you want to arrive some data point, which is represent for the X1 sample from the P data, right? So how can you imply this kind of the requirement in the mathematic form, which is the second term of the minimization. So you can just, as you said, we can we construct some L2 norm between my current state and ideal state, and then I I I I I propose some random matrix R. So so the cost matrix R to evaluate how far my current state from the ideal state. Mm -hmm. Right. This part is easy to be understood. And just to say, just assume we minimized the terminal cost. We have minimized, which means uh, we, we arrive at the X1 and the V1 at the end of the day. And we start from some data point, right? But the intermediate transfer can be arbitrary. Like right. I can go to the Paris, to London, and then I go to the V1 and the X1. Mm -hmm. Or I can go to China and uh, go to New Zealand, and then I go to the V1 and X1. And, it, and uh -huh. both of them will minimize the terminal cost in the, in the second term, right? Mm -hmm. It will be zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the integral of the AT will be different, right? Mm -hmm. And the AT means how far you traveled, right? Mm -hmm. So in the control theory, uh, you will have some requirement in the con in the control theory that tells us uh, we would like to come up with some control sequence, but it should minimize the effort. Just like the human beings, like when you want to do some task, you want 
I do you want me to do this task as efficient as possible? Mm-hmm. And this is the motivation. So the the integral of the ATL2 norm DT, it says that we want to do this task as fast as possible or, or as efficient as possible. And it will lead to some some benefit of the of the generative modeling. If you go up to this paper a little bit, I have mm-hmm. one remark. Okay. Yeah, the remark one. Ah, okay, yeah. So you can basically find out the flow matching and the bridge matching can be derived from the same way and it will have exactly the same results. Can you just can you just click on the uh the the appendix D1? Yes. It looks very familiar, right? So you have the system like the DXT equal to UDT and U will be your control and you are minimizing the UT over the time and you want to minimize in some L2 norm as the second term. And this problem setup will lead to the bridge matching and the flow matching. Can you go down a little bit? So after some derivation, mm-hmm. you will get the equation. Oh, sorry, I did not put the index here, but you will see the equation right in front of the remark seven. And this is- So the Brownian system. bridge? Yeah, it is mm-hmm. a Brown, it is called Brownian bridge and it will degenerate to the flow matching when the DW term disappear. Mm-hmm. And it is exactly the same as the bridge matching. Mm-hmm. So, so this, is essentially, this is essentially telling us the path of change for any given point any given yeah. pixel in the distribution? Uh, distribution. Or is it for, okay. Since, since the drift term is a, is a, fun, is a, fun, is a functional field, right? So you, you can, the input could be a distribution, the, the data point from the distribution, and it's just like the push forward functional. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. One so, follow up question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the, the summary here is that regardless of the flow matching and the bridge matching or the AGM, all of them can be derived from the stochastic optimal control theory, which is uh, using the exact same problem formulation, which is uh, showing in the, okay, go up a, a little bit in the equation in the D1. Like you can formulate some, yeah, you can formulate some optimization problem and you can solve it analytically and it depends on how does your dynamics look like, it will lead to the flow matching, bridge matching and AGM. Yeah. Okay, that's clear. One follow-up question I would have is uh, in the context of um, your particular algorithm, let me see if I can find the equation again. I agree what you're saying that we're putting this in here to minimize sort of the effort of the optimization, but why is it that we're putting the acceleration as a term here? Like to me, it seems like the relevant one to integrate over in a case like this would be the velocity. If we're trying to minimize, I mean, I mean, it's a question of what we're trying to minimize, but my understanding after looking at uh, one of the preliminary figures as well, let's see if I can find that. Um, after looking at this figure, where we're essentially plotting the paths, and I'm not sure exactly in what space these are, but it seems like we're, what we're looking to do seems to be to minimize the amount of uh, oscillation that we have in the path traveled itself for any yeah. given image or any given pixel or whatever. Um, it seems like if you're trying to minimize that, what you want to integrate over is actually the, the velocity, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're trying to minimize the amount of fluctuation uh, in absolute terms that you get. Am I thinking about that wrong? Or could you please elaborate a little bit on why it is the acceleration in particular that we put into equation five? Uh, the, I think it's a very, very good question. So at the very first uh, beginning of doing this research, we were trying to minimize the velocity. Okay. And, uh, and in practice, it is uh, intractable. Just like, uh, just to think about the one case, you have the oh. very good velocity at the very first, uh, very first uh, beginning. 
and uh, then you want to minimize the velocity uh, with the control of the acceleration, then, then just think about two, two cases. The first one is that you are minimizing the velocity over the acceleration, right? Since the velocity is a function of the A, right? And if you have the very good velocity and just think about it, you don't have the noise, then what will happen? You, your acceleration is zero. Since you already have the very good velocity, then then, then you, you don't really need to change. Mm -hmm. Just uh, recall our principle of this kind of the training. Uh, you want to appro to approximate this acceleration by using a neural network. Then what is input? Regardless of what kind of input you have, you will always output zero since your velocity is perfect then the training will degenerate. You will never train something useful or meaningful. Mm -hmm. And uh, alternatively, you can, you can construct a, some very bad velocity, right? Then you, you all have some acceleration, which indeed works, and the output will be the different, right? But in this case, uh, the trust rate will be arbitrarily bad. Just think about the first uh, picture. Can you just uh, go up yeah, sure. a little bit? We, um, yes. Yeah. Just think about the the second case. We we artificially uh, mess up with the velocity since we want to train the at, and then mm. it will end up with uh, the something like the CLD. You have the very bad velocities, and we want to train it. Then the mm -hmm. transfer will not be straight and smooth. So, so this is the reason why we choose the AT. Okay. We were thinking about minimizing the VT, and mathematically it should not have any problem. But in practice, it sh it, it will not work. And mm -hmm. uh, in in parallel, there's a, uh, another work from my friend. friend. Uh, I can send you the paper link later. So they, mm -hmm. they basically, uh, they are basically doing the same thing you proposed. And they come up with another methodology, just like they propose another loss function to constrain, to constrain the, the, the velocity field. So, so it is doable, but, but you, you may take another branch of the research. Yeah. OK. OK. Yeah, sure. If you share that, then I can put it in the description of the video mm -hmm. as well. So if anyone's interested, they can have a look. Um, yeah. Is there so clear that you're putting it in there because it's intractable to put the velocity at least uh, just plainly in the in the same equation? Um, is putting the acceleration in its raw form like that um, what you want to do? Or would you potentially want to use some other um, some other function of this? Uh, so you're asking, can I use the add function for this? <clears throat> no, I'm, ju I'm wondering whether just putting the acceleration as is without any additional uh, manipulation is um, seems to be the, the best approach. Like, alternatively, you could have some function of the, of the acceleration here. It wouldn't necessarily be the unity function, which it seems to be that you're applying now. Um, yeah, so, so in practice, you, you can use the different functional for it, just like the L1 or L, L infinite. So, mm -hmm. so that's another branch of another branch of the work in the country theory, which is mm -hmm. uh, robust L1 adapt, uh, adaptive control. So they are basically considering the L1 cost. So mm -hmm. the L1 cost have one, one, one benefits. Uh, and I think it, it is called the bang, bang, the bang bang control, which is quite famous in this area. So, 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 the trust rate will be the zigzag like, but but I am not quite sure about the benefits of adapting of adapting this. So so yeah. So mm -hmm. you so you have the different choice for the functional of the at in the integral, but 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 for this one, I I I just choose one most classical 
set up in the control theory. Okay. Okay. Fair. Maybe we can have a look at the, the next proposition that comes as a consequence of this. So we're saying when R goes to infinity here, R being, I think, the penalty, mm -hmm. um, the, the solution becomes the following. So is there something uh, conceptual that we want to say about this? Yeah, so because conceptually, it's a very easy to understand. So mm -hmm. as I mentioned, you have the, ter the terminal state. And yeah. And our goal is uh, we want to arrive this terminal state at the end of the day. So if you look at the equation five, it is n it does not satisfy this requirement, right? I only put some penalty, but this penalty mm -hmm. will not guarantee this stuff, mm -hmm. right? So we have some trade-off between the cost of the control cost and the terminal cost. So, so we call the terms in the, so, so we call the integral term as the control cost and the terms in the uh, some M transport R times some bracket is the terminal cost. So if the R does not tend to infinite, so we are basically playing a trading off of the control and the terminal cost, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. if the R tends to infinite, which means we assume we, we, we have to arrive the x1 at the terminal time steps. Mm -hmm. Given this assumption, can yeah. I derive some optimal control at here? Mm -hmm. So this is the concept of uh, the proposition three. That's like when r tends to infinite, my penalty of my terminal state ten tend to infinite, how can I solve the minimization problem? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you will have the analytic solution, which is shown in the equation six. Okay, good. I would like to, what I would like to have a look at next, because we're quite short on time actually, is uh, the algorithms associated with uh, both the training and sampling of this. Um, yep. Is there anything you think ought to be mentioned before that, or should we switch to those? I think so far so good. Uh, okay. Yeah. If we start with the training, um, I think some of the initial steps here are quite straightforward. We sample, et cetera. We calculate mean and covariance. Um, we have F here that we calculate, which is quite central uh, to, to, the, um, to the training. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really discussed it yet. Would you mind introducing what that quantity represents and why it's important? Oh, you mean the FT? So FT yes. is the combination of, so, so I think you may need to go up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Just to click on the equation seven in, in this algorithm. Uh -huh. You will directly jump to the equation seven. So yeah. at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, the dynamics world looks like the equation seven. And uh, what is F? So if, if we don't have the, if we don't have the Gaussian noise, so so if we are considering the stochastic differential equation, the F is basically the A star we we derived in the proposition three, right? Okay. And HT is a non-zero quantity, so so it's just a, a a scalar, and then you will have the stochastic differential equation and. Uh, we can follow our previous training principle just using a neural network to approximate the FT, which is essentially the AT star, right? Mm -hmm. That's clear. Okay. So that is for the stochastic differential equation. And for the probabilistic ODE, it's slightly more complicated. But, and if we, for the audience who are familiar with this diffusion model, uh, it's a super simple. So, there's a one equation when one can transform from the stochastic differential equation to the ordinary differential equation. If you, if you look at the last line of the equation seven, the HT will tend to zero. However, the drift term, the one in front of the DT, will add an additional term, which is a minus one over two GT squared, blah, 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 blah. And uh, this comes from some uh, very classical results from the diffusion model area. So you can do this transfer transformation from 
uh, from the stochastic differential equation, equation to the ODE. And uh, if you do so, uh, the FT will, no, will be no more the acceleration. As you mentioned, it will not be the derivative of the velocity, right? It is invalid to call it uh, an acceleration. So here I just artificially name it as a force term. And it is, as you may know, in the, in the Newtonian dynamics, it is a, the term which changed the state of the, the position. So I, I, just, I just call it the force. So, so and again, we, we just follow the principle of the, the training, just like using a neural network to regress this F term. Regardless, it is a SD or an ODE. Yeah. Okay. okay, very good. Let's go back to the algorithms then, and then we can talk about the sampling as well yeah. before we start looking at sure. some conclusive results. Um, so we have this scheme here, and maybe we can talk about the samplers a little bit. So mm -hmm. uh, what are those? What choices do we have? And why do we select the particular ones that are uh, listed here? Yeah, for the SSS, I, sorry, I don't really remember the full name. I think it's listed before this, right? Here, stochastic sampler. I think it's this one. Symmetric splitting sampler. Oh, yeah, sampler. yeah, yeah, yeah. What is called? Uh, the symmetric splitting sampler. So the reason I, I, I choose this one is uh, because it is effective. So it, is, uh, it's, it comes from the previous work. So I, oh. I don't deserve any credit from it. So, 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 so the long story in short, the long story in short, so, so long as your dynamics is linear, what do you can do? So let me explain it a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I hope you can understand it. Since, since the concept of it is uh, super simple, but in practice it's a very hard algorithm. Uh, uh -huh. Can you go to the equation maybe three? Is this one, no? Oh, yeah, it's a, a very good example. So you can have the two terms in the brackets, right? So, <sighs> shit, maybe, uh, I think I don't have a very good example here, but just to think about three. All right, so you have mm -hmm. the two terms, mm -hmm. the F and uh, minus one over two, blah, blah, blah. And we call it the score term. It's usually to be the non the nonlinear term, but the F will be the linear term. All right, mm -hmm. so you basically have the linear combined with the nonlinear term in the drift term. Mm -hmm. And it is a well-known fact is that if your dynamics is linear, you can write down the analytically solution of the dynamics. All right, mm -hmm. it's a ground truth fact. And uh, in, so, so in the previous work, they are considering the stochastic differential equation. So uh, additional to the equation three, they will have the plus GT DWT, which is shown in the equations four, and that is the reason why I don't have the very good example here. But but uh, let's recall: so long as the dynamics is linear, we can, regardless of the OD or the SD, you can write down the analytically solution, which means you don't need to predict. So you, you don't need to propagate your dynamics like the times the dt and you integral over the time, you can have the solution. Okay. And the SSS says, so for each one step, one step of the propagation, we predict the analytically solution of the linear part of the dynamics for the half step and based on the solution of the half step, I propagated the dynamics for another half step for the nonlinear part. So for- Okay, and only I, the nonlinear part, or do you also include the drift in that? You don't include the, the linear part. You only predict the nonlinear part for the one step. Okay. Yeah, so it is a core concept of this algorithm, just like for each one step, you separate it into the two step and the one for the analytically prediction and another one for the nonlinear part. That's it. Mm -hmm. But okay. since we have the very complex 
uh, dynamics. So you need to adapt this kind of the algorithm in our setup. But I won't say it's my credit because uh, it had been proposed a few years ago. So I so mm. in my paper, I just write a one paragraph to introduce this one and add some mm. citation and that's it. Mm. But for the second one, it's more interesting. So which is for the exponential integrator. Can you go down a little bit? Yeah, here. Okay, so it is quite interesting. So for the momentum dynamics, if you are looking for the faster sampling, which means the interval of each time step is very large, right? And it will lead to a very serious problem. <laughs> Just to think about the dynamics, which is shown in, sorry, I think you may have to go up a, a little bit okay. here. Ah, okay. Yeah. Just to think about we have the learned functional F, right? So when you try to propagate your dynamics, what do you do? So you, you, you choose a very small DT and you X T plus one equal to X T plus the VT times the DT, right? And you can find that for the propagation of your position, the learned force term will not participate in the propagation, right? But for the VT, the VT equal to the VT plus the delta T times the FT. And the input of the FT will be your position and the velocity. So, which means, your current velocity and the position will not directly influence the position at the current time step t. Or in the other words, it will influence your position until the next time steps. And what is the problem here? So your control or your force term will not reflect into the trajectory of the position in time, it will uh, it will always have this kind of the delay. And when you are doing the fast sampling of the dynamics, it will be a disaster, especially when your time horizon uh, the 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 time step is very large. And the Wait, way we, yeah the way we solve it is by using the exponential integrator, which is showing in the next few pages. Can you mm -hmm. go down a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, here, the equation 11. So mm -hmm. by, by doing this trick, you can find that the learn term, which is the S theta here, will be injected into your position and the velocity simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And then you won't have any delay. Okay. And uh, this is uh, the core techniques for the fast sampling. And, uh, and again, <laughs> it is a well-known algorithm. Uh, it has been proposed uh, maybe few few decades ago. It is a very classical algorithm in the uh, dynamical numerical analysis and mm -hmm. the theory. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's... It's also not my credit. I just use them. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, we're actually shortly over time now. So uh, I would still like to have a short look at some of the results that you uh, pr produced. Yep. If you still have the time. So would you mind maybe just very briefly summarizing what the main takeaways were in terms of performance? Was there anything that surprised you with the performance or were things kind of ending up where you expected them to? Uh, I think the... F uh, the motivation of this work is uh, for the fast sampling. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the results of the fast sampling is uh, is kind of the impressive, but I won't say it's very impressive. It's just uh, better than some com competitive baseline at that mm -hmm. time. Can you go down to some like the table? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the table four, uh, I compare with the flow matching and uh, the extension of the flow matching, which they published one year later, which is mm -hmm. called multi-sample flow matching, multi-sample optimal transport flow matching, MFM. 
uh, you can find that uh, we can achieve a way much better performance when the number of the function evaluation is uh, one third of them. Uh, but I won't say it is uh, impressive in, in enough because uh, I think 40 or 30 is still a quite high number of function evaluation. So my ultimate goal is make the number uh, within to be within five. So, so even though it looks okay, but it's not good in, enough for me. But another even more impressive part is the conditional generation. Uh, can you go down a little bit? So it is quite, uh, it is unpredicted results. So we, we, we have done this experiment just uh, one day before the submission. Mm -hmm. so, so the concept here is that given your current position, you can admit the different velocity, right? Which is uh, different from the diffusion model and the flow matching. And we are thinking about what things you can admit the different velocity. Then, can I use, can I utilize this property to do the conditional generation? Just a, just you come from you you start from the same data point, but yeah. you apply the different velocity for it. So here, we first try the conditional generation, which is in the second line. So we condition on this uh, small cat here, yeah. and then we make it blur. The way mm -hmm. to blur it is super simple. I just uh, uh, weighted summation of this image with some Gaussian noise, mm -hmm. and I treat it as a conditional velocity, and it will lead to the all the old cat generation, which is showing on the second row on the right-hand side. All right. And another interesting conditional generation is called the stroke-based generation, which is showing on the last row. For the last row, since our dynamics is linear, you can write down the analytic solution of the conditional distribution of the velocity given some corrupted data point xt. So by doing this, we can sample the velocity given the corrupted x. All right, now we have the corrupted image like a cat. Then we can sample the velocity to, re to recover this. And it is showing in the last line. So, 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 and we don't need to retrain or fine tune our model to adapt our model to be a a a a a, a, a interpolation or the conditional generative model. Just as you may know, uh, for the diffusion model, if you want to the con if you want to do the conditional generation, you either need to retrain your model to be the condition uh, to do the classifier free conditional diffusion model or you need to train another classifier to, to, to do the conditional generation, or you need to compute the Jacobian of your neural network to do the, to do the guidance of your diffusion process. But in our case, you don't, you don't need to do neither of them. So I think this is quite interesting. So yeah, yeah. agreed. <laughs> If you ask me which part is the most in, impressive or in, interesting, I will say the conditional generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let me just toss you a last question then. So I agree, this is very interesting. And mm -hmm. what I would be interesting to wrap up with as a question is just what uh, avenues for further exploration you think are most promising. You noted before that you think in the case of fast sampling, you would like to cut down the number of function evaluations from, I think it was uh, 40 or whatever we had in the table to something like five. Um, are there any avenues that you think are promising for, for taking this research further? Uh, yeah, one, there's a few ways. So the, the first one is the, you, you can map the whole framework to the latent space. And it is well known that in the in the latent space, it is uh, 
smoother, and uh, probably it can cut down the number of function evaluation by half. But it is still not good enough. And uh, another very popular techniques on the market is called the uh, distillation, and uh, you can distillate the long trajectory of the path to be the one to be the one step. So for the distillation, the concept is uh, super simple as well. You just uh, just uh, predict from the one data point to another data point. You just uh, jump from the zero to one. But, but but you need to progressively to do this prediction, just like during the training, you just predict from the zero to one half and from the one half to the one, and then you merge them. So uh, there's a, an, another possible branch of the extension, just like you, you can leverage the distillation to cut down the number of the function evaluation. And, uh, and the last one is my favorite one, uh, which is literally solving the Schrodinger bridge problem or the optimal transport problem. You can have the mathematically solid methodology to have the one number of the function evaluation prediction. So, so I forgot to, so, so I think I mentioned once before, uh, my previous research is about the Schrodinger bridge and optimal transport. Mm -hmm. So, so the concept of, so, so I mentioned the concept, just like you can use the optimal transport or the shooting bridge to map from one distribution to another one, right? But there's a one property for this mapping. It is the straightest uh, map. Just like the transport will be uh, one constant velocity line, which means if the transport is a constant straight line, then you don't need to integrate over the time. You can just predict it from the zero to one, but it is well known optimal transport and the shooting bridge is very hard to be solved. And uh, it, even my previous work is uh, not that scalable, even though it can be applied to the image, but I cannot apply it to the very high dimensional super resolution pictures. So so I think it's, a, it's still a very hard open question in the area yeah an interesting one nonetheless yeah good i think we can close it here i appreciate you taking the time to go over the paper mm -hmm. with me i had a great time so thank you for for doing it mm -hmm. all right i appreciate it. thanks <laughs>